Hello everyone. Welcome to the incredible world of Manwa through the series, Existence. Let's explore the eternal world where a mysterious creature had existed for billions of years throughout the history timeline. This entity was not immortal, but whenever he died he would be reborn as a different kind of creature with intact past life memories. So where was the origin of this strange creature? And was he created by the universe with a special mission? If you're extremely eager to find the answer, please destroy the like and subscribe buttons and don't forget to leave your comments down below before diving in to know more about the whole story. Let's get started. The story begins with a battle scene between a young man and a group of defense guards with iron armor linked as a solid wall. The young man made an extraordinary foot kick on the ground. As a result, layers of rock broke apart and buried numerous fighters. Huge explosions also appeared, bringing illuminating flames like his angry eyes at that time. So what exactly was that guy? He was a distinctive species that was reborn thousands of times. A fish in a lake, a bird in the wide sky, a tiny ant on the ground, and sometimes a huge dinosaur in the jungle are definitely what he was in his endless loop. No matter what he reincarnated as, he hated humans the most. It was understandable that humans had killed a host of creatures for fun, not simply for survival according to natural law. In the form of a weak creature, he could not fight against the modern weapons of the strongest creature on the planet. Every time he died, he wondered what torture he continuously endured under the cruel hands of humans. When he was killed by hunters for ivory, the pain caused him to beg everything to stop. However, he eventually overcame the most painful rebirth throughout his journey. This made him eager for a new life because the more tremendous pain he suffered, the higher chance he was at the top of the food chain. Expectedly, he was indeed reincarnated as the creature at the top of the current food chain, the one he hated most, human. For the first time, he had a name, Li Jain. Since birth, Jain never cried or spoke. After taking an examination, he was shown to have no issues, just as he was only six years old. The doctor advised Jain's mother to seek a psychologist for treatment. Nevertheless, Jain's mother confronted the doctor for considering Jain a mentally disturbed child. Oh Young Xiu, Jain's mother, was an ignorant and arrogant woman who had lost her family and her husband in a fierce war. Even though the world in her eyes was actually harsh and cruel, she lived to nurture her son by carrying Jia In on her back and selling vegetables at the market every day. Young Xiu always said she loved Jia In every evening. Jia In could not understand what she said, but he felt warm at all and aware of the somewhat difference in his life. In the quiet of the evening, a group of people were chasing animals. They were astonished and wondered how Jia In could climb up and stand on a tall pole. To Jia In, humans were the bad ones, so he seized the perfect opportunity to test his abilities. Jia In leaped to the ground like a frog, sprinted speedily like a cheetah, and killed one of the men like a dinosaur with abilities he had never before possessed. This proved that Jia In owned all the living creature's strength he had encountered, and this might perhaps be his last life. This makes him feel relieved because in the end, he can finally die. Witnessing the scene of the young boy killing someone with just one punch, the detective, unable to maintain his composure, immediately attacked Jia In. Jia In endured the punch and as a result he fell to the ground. Jia In felt the pain as he suffered the injury, helping him understand more about his abilities. From that moment, he realized that if he didn't manifest his powers, he would be just an ordinary person. Jia In sensed the next punch from his opponent and unleashed the strength of the turtle, dislocating the assailant's arm. Continuing to utilize the power of the chimpanzee, Jia In almost brought the detective's life to an end. Unfortunately, at this very moment, Jia In was shot unexpectedly by the criminal, the bullet piercing through him. His vision blurred and he quickly collapsed. Thinking he had killed someone, the criminal became fearful and fled, leaving Jia In behind and alone. The bullet had penetrated Jia In's body, causing immense pain. However, with the regenerative instinct of a sea cucumber, his wounds miraculously began to heal. Jia In was alive, 
but he didn't seem pleased with this outcome. The overwhelming power left him full of doubts. Looking into the distance, he could even hear his mother's voice calling his name, but it felt hollow in his soul. In the far distance, young Shil's cry echoed as she found Jain. She immediately ran to hug Jain and sobbed. This sacred maternal affection was the first thing he felt since he was born, and it was also a miracle that had gradually warmed his cold heart for millennia. Finally, Jia In was willing to say that he loved his mother, the most miraculous thing for young Shil during her six years of motherhood. She couldn't hold back her tears and burst in front of her baby son. Jia In indeed felt that humans had a little bit of kindness, and at the same time, the person he called mom is the only reason he wanted to exist until now. Therefore, he decided to let himself live a normal human life. At the police station, the criminal was caught. He tried to tell the police about Ja In's bizarre existence, but the detective dimed him out due to a deep conspiracy he plotted in his rotten mind. The detective tried to disprove the criminal's testimony and accused him of perjury. Consequently, Ja In's identity had not been revealed. About Ja In, after the incident that day, young Shil cared much more about his safety, especially his mother would always hold his hand tightly every time they went out. For a long time, his mother did everything to protect him from being threatened outside by warning the schoolmates who bullied Ja In, yelling at the gossipy neighbors who talked behind her son's back, or throwing a tantrum when someone came to scramble for a place to sell in the market. Young Shil was constantly fighting the world to protect her son, and that made Ja In feel extremely warm. As time went on, Ja In began to get acquainted with the human body and how life went on. But he also feared losing his present body and wanted to be with young Shil for a long time. However, for a superhuman being like him, being around a normal human could be a danger to his mother's life. And the most unexpected thing also happened. The detective, the only person who knew of his abilities, returned to find him and made sure that he was still alive. He was overjoyed that he could enjoy the excitement of hunting down the monster that had nearly killed him years ago. Eventually, everything worst must come. On the day Ja In's mother was ill, he lied to his mother that he was going to school, but actually he brought the apples that he had picked to the market to make a living. Tragedy struck when an unexpected encounter between him and the detective happened. This hideous detective accused Ja In to be a spy and took him away. In order to ensure her mother's peace, Ja In reluctantly let him take him away in handcuffs. In spite of Ja In's concession, the detective still forcefully put Ja In to his trumps by saying like, mother's darlings were but milksop heroes. Which meant that when Ja In was a spy, his mother was too, so he called someone to arrest young Shil. Ja In couldn't calm down anymore because the only one holding him back from human life was in danger. He broke the handcuffs and ran back home at high speed to save young Shil, despite being seen as a monster in public. That was also the villainous plot of the detective. He slandered a 12-year-old boy to be a spy and then controlled Ja In's mother to force Ja In to reveal his eccentric nature and abilities. But it seemed that the detective had too much contempt for Ja In when he only saw Ja In as a monster, but a creature full of power to completely erase the human presence on the entire earth. With his terrifying speed, Ja In quickly returned home from the market before the detectives caught his mother. Unfortunately, young Shil opened the door and saw a bunch of strangers trying to take her son away. Despite the fact that she was ill, she still tried to find the neighbor's assistance to protect her son. In contrast, because the detectives believed in their leader's conclusion that Ja In and his mother were both spies, they were not lenient with young Shil. At young Shil's harsh reactions, they knocked her down to the ground. This was the last straw. Young Shil had been attacked by these disgusting people pushed the initial rage in Ja In's body to its climax, burned through his sanity and unleashed his overwhelming power. As quick as a flash, the unfortunate detectives had to die at the hands of a 12-year-old child. 
The boy did not dare to face his mother because he was afraid that his mother would see him as a monster after seeing that scene. But Ja In never knew that, no matter what was going on, he would always be her lovely, obedient child. At the same time, the evil detective also arrived, and witnessing his accusations about Ja In being a killer monster, young Shil stood up and confessed to killing those detectives even though she couldn't even eat properly as a normal, healthy person. With the great unconditional love from his mother, Ja In's heart ached every time. For the first time in his life, Ja In knew how to cry and how to torment himself for the great sacrifices his mother had made to preserve him from danger. In his mind, people had been the most abject thing. However, the woman in front of him right then was indeed the thing he had cherished most in his long life, and she was in deadly danger. The head detective with a corrupt personality dictated that everyone shoot at Ja In's mother. To protect his mother, Ja In stood up for her and was able to block all the bullets confidently and easily without being injured. That made the detectives totally surprised in high fear and frantically fired dozens of bullets at the mother and daughter. As a mother who considered her child as the whole world, when she saw her little child being trampled and cruelly treated by everyone in the world around her, young Shill's heart felt as if she had thousands of knives pierced in it. At that time, the tolerance of a woman who had been inherently extravagant and loved her children unconditionally reached the highest threshold. Like a flash of lightning, she gathered all her strength to stand up and made full use of her weak body to cover Ja In from dozens of bullets, and death is naturally inevitable for an ordinary person like her. Young Shil breathed her last, right next to Ja In. At that moment, with his extraordinary strength, Ja In was able to connect with his mother. In the unknown space, Ja In's mother comforted Ja In a lot when he expressed his wish to die so that he could see young Shil soon because he no longer had any reason to continue living. But he had to live, no matter what happened. He had to promise to survive, because of young Xu. The death of his mother had led Ja In to the conclusion that he would forever be able to coexist with humanity, and his presence was chaos for the world. Either he or everyone else would be destroyed. In order to fulfill his mother's last wish that he must survive, he decided to erase human existence from the earth. As a result, to not hurt his mother if she saw the murder scene, he ran away to lure the detectives to the flower field where beautiful memories of Ja In and his mother were associated. From then on, he admitted his existence was something very eccentric, but so as humans, because humans had also destroyed many inherent things of nature. In the end, Ja In also had his own unique answer to boundless power, that because the planet gave birth to him, to push humanity to the brink of extinction. After pulling the detectives away from his house, Ja In quickly punished the conscientious scoundrels who stole his most precious one. Terrible strength and burning anger turned Ja In into a cannon that rushed towards those evil people. The corpses of the martyrs lay on the cracked ground. Only the head detective survived with faint strength. However, this arrogant guy kept cursing Ja In as a monster that deserved extermination. In Ja In's eyes, that detective was just a failed asshole bastard who represented the foolish humanity to murder him. Consequently, all humans in this world would suffer his wrath. After saying that, Ja In smashed the detective's head into tiny pieces. During the whole way back home, Ja In couldn't stop crying when holding his mother in his arms. He cried because all the peaceful past with his mother was rushing back. He cried because when he returned home, he would be alone in the house without his mother, his only companion in this strange world. He cried because all the moments he had with his mother were gone. However, compared to the millions of years of impermanence passing, that fleeting moment for Ja In was all he had. Endless love and wonderful joy were something that merely existed when mother was by his side. Therefore, no existence or disappearance could hurt Ja In much more. In indeterminate thought, Ja In kept walking until he came to an entirely strange land where he met a hunter who had already killed a pheasant. With hatred and antipathy running in his blood, Ja In intended to kill him. But when being asked about his parents, Ja In involuntarily retracted his hand and said that his parents had died. 
The hunter's eyes showed serious concern. He quickly dressed Jia In in the coat and led him to his house. At that small house, an old mother was sitting and waiting for her son to return from the forest every day. Although there was an invisible distance between them, simple but warm gestures in a frugal family meal had warmed Jia In's petrified heart since the day his mother died. Once again in his human life, Jia In felt the great love they gave him, and his little faith in humans was rekindled. Because of the lack of conditions and the lack of necessities in the distant cold forest, the elder mother and the hunter could not afford to take care of Jia In sufficiently. The next morning, the hunter decided to take Jia In to the bustling town to find a better place that would give him the best future. On the way to his new home, Jia In boldly expressed his curiosity by asking the hunter why he still talked to his mother every day, even though she was unable to speak or hear anything. The hunter mused for several seconds. His face shone with an indescribable emotion. He told Jia In that although his mother herself could not hear or could not say what she demanded, she still understood love. It was the connection of motherhood which demonstrated when a mother did not need her son to be aware of what she wanted and what he gave her. Nevertheless, she was always willing to listen with all her heart to what her son dreamed about. This made Jia In's mood gradually better, but this brief happiness was quickly extinguished. The heavy rain came, and the two struggled to find shelter on the side of the road. Recently, neighboring enterprises had cut down all the trees. Therefore, when the rain was heavy like cats and dogs, it also led to a landslide phenomenon on a large scale. Layers of rock and snow were pulling together and crashing down below, pressing on the poor hunter. Jia In panicked and ran to dig through the layers of rock to save the hunter's life. When he mentioned his mother, Jia In was absolutely dumbfounded. If he died, who would take care of his old mother? Finally, the miracle had not happened that the hunter did not survive this disaster. Carrying the hunter on his back, Jia In was lethargic and helpless. And once again, Jia In went through the pain of witnessing the person he respected die right in front of his eyes. Jia In looks at the city from above and feels things are slowly improving. His hands are bloody. Extinction is not as easy as it appears. It is difficult, but he thinks he can do it. Jia In is at the cemetery, thinking about how the shock of her son's death led to her death in her sleep a few days later. First, he needs to figure out what power he has. Now he can call on the powers of all living beings. Jia In thinks he can become anything. The problem is that if he's not actively thinking, he will return to the body of an ordinary human. He can't do anything like this. One year has passed. The train driver was alarmed by the appearance of Jia In in the middle of the tracks. Jia In swings his arms using his strength. The driver saw no one in the middle of the tracks. Jia In was far away in the field, away from the rain. The toughness of the Corbiculidae's teeth. He's managed to maintain that state within his subconscious. Another year has passed. Jia In gathered all the animals for him. He's learned how to communicate with all living beings. It wasn't through speaking. If he had to describe it in one word, I'd call it telepathy. It was easier than he expected. He has developed a sixth sense, and understanding animals at a basic level does help. It's largely due to this body's human nature. He thinks most living beings on Earth tend to like humans, and he thinks this is questionable. Five years have passed. Jia In's body has reached physical adulthood. He thought it'd be beneficial to maintain this part of his body, so he accomplished that with the ability of a turtle. Ten years have passed. His communication skills weren't limited to living beings. His hand touched the ground, the dirt, the water, and even the plants. No, it must mean that life exists within all of these. He can feel this earth and its suffering. It's dying. Thirty years. He clenched his fist, and he thought he was able to train the ability that he had and there was no limit to what he was capable of. Additionally, he found that combining abilities was possible. This means he is done with all his preparations. The question is, should he do it now? It was incredibly straightforward. He would send intense heat deep into the ground and apply some pressure. Repeating this process a couple of times would trigger an earthquake, a massive earthquake that would rip the earth apart. With his current abilities, there were six locations around the world 
where he could induce an earthquake of the same magnitude. These earthquakes would shatter the six continents into fragments, with over half of them swallowed by the turbulent seas. The human race would face total extinction in this catastrophic event. It was very simple, but humans would not be the only creatures to die. He desired to carry out his plan, but he still hesitated. He had been alone for decades. Shouldn't he see what the humans were like now? He had seen them since their inception. After all, he could execute it whenever he pleased, so there was no need to rush. However, upon witnessing the world, his creation, undergoing extensive transformations caused by humanity, he realized that there was no place on Earth left untouched by human influence. Even the path he was currently walking, which used to be a lush forest filled with acacia flowers, had succumbed to change. He made up his mind to put an end to the existence of mankind. In that moment, a woman driving a car suddenly sped towards him, seemingly taken aback by his presence. The vehicle swerved abruptly and plunged into a ravine. Yet as he gazed upon the face of the female driver, the main character seemingly caught sight of the wildest daisy blossoms. He bravely rushed forward to prevent the car from plummeting. The girl was saved, but the protagonist suffered severe injuries. Transitioning scenes, when he regained consciousness, the male lead found himself in a hospital, surrounded by unfamiliar surroundings. When asked by the doctor, he couldn't recall anything about his identity, except that his name was Lee Ja-In. Three months later at the police station, the policeman couldn't gather any information about that man. They had no idea who he could be. He had no memories except for his name, but they weren't sure if that was his real name, as there was a possibility of complete memory loss or him being an illegal immigrant. It would be easier if he had a guardian to ensure his well-being. Upon asking again to confirm about the guardian's right, the female lead seemed to know what she needed to do next. She brought the male lead to the local government office to complete the procedure of becoming his guardian. The process wasn't overly complicated, they just had to fill out a form and provide the necessary information. Once it was done, the two of them walked out, and the expression on her face seemed somewhat frustrated, which made Li Jian unable to contain his curiosity and ask for the reason. She wanted to emphasize that it wasn't her fault, but rather a landslide. However, due to his temporary memory loss, he couldn't understand what she meant. She registered him as 24 years old, thinking it would be better if he appeared younger. She also mentioned to him that she was 34 years old, so he should have good manners towards someone older. Surely she couldn't believe that a man with a youthful face like his could actually have an estimated age of around 3.5 billion years old. Then she told him that he could stay at her dorm until he found a new place to live. When he suddenly held her hand, he was taken aback. Complaining about him needing to go ask for permission before holding someone's hand, she received a sarcastic question from him asking for permission. This time, she directly held his hand and pulled him along, not waiting for him to hold hers. He pondered something and tears fell from his eyes, yet he didn't realize that he was the one crying. She led him to a cafe owned by her best friend, and the three of them sat down, enjoying their coffee and engaging in conversation. Her best friend glanced at him with a displeased expression, not quite pleased with the sudden arrival of a man who would be living together with her best friend. Then the two of them stepped outside to have a private conversation. The female lead admitted that it was strange indeed to let a stranger move into their shared house. However, she felt a sense of responsibility due to her role in his memory loss. Furthermore, she didn't find him threatening, so she wasn't overly concerned. The best friend of the female lead couldn't convince her any further, so she left the decision up to her. During their discussion, the female lead stated that from now on the male lead would stay in a room above the cafe and work there to support himself until he regained his memory. His face showed disappointment and reluctance as he wanted to live with her. Regardless of his pleas, the decision had been made and she didn't want to change it. Now she would introduce him to her best friend and move out to work at a facility industry company. As the three of them were heading outside, they encountered a corgi dog, which happened to be Royce. This dog was not friendly with anyone except the female lead. However, contrary to the female lead's welcoming, the dog immediately ran towards Lee Ji-An. 
wagging its tail and making friends. This both angered and surprised the female lead. In the moment when the male lead touched Royce, it seemed like an exchange of energy occurred between them. At that moment, a large truck from the female lead's company passed by. Royce quickly ran after the truck, barking. A dog's sense of smell is a thousand times better than that of a human's. Lee Ja-in, who had borrowed the powers of a dog, suddenly smelled something too. The being inside the car emitted an overwhelmingly intense emotion that even the current amnesiac, Ja-in, could sense. That emotion was hostility towards the human race. In a company seminar, people were discussing Hydra. Hydra is a type of Nidaria, and it possesses a remarkable ability to regenerate its entire body, even if only one in 200 parts of it survives. Researchers were conducting experiments on Hydra and reported that when they cut off one of its 10 tentacles, it would regenerate within a few days. Many scientists are currently working on creating proteins that can halt this regeneration process. If they can achieve that, it might be possible to apply the same principle to cancer cells. They also discovered a new species of Hydra underwater, named Steer. Returning to the cafe, the female lead expressed her desire to go to the church, while the male lead wanted to quit his job and follow her. When asked if he believed in the existence of God, he replied that he was sure there is a God because everything is just too perfect for there to be none in this world. Despite losing millions of years of memories on Earth, he still had a deep conviction. The world around us is perfect, and there's no way they would allow the perfect balance of this world to be disrupted. However, there are still tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, hail, and other natural disasters. A being was created to maintain that balance, born with the sole purpose of survival. The survival instinct of this being is to drive humanity to extinction. There are only two beings on Earth who share this purpose. One of them is trapped, and the other has no memory of himself. Eventually, these two will cross paths with each other. No one could have predicted what would happen then. Today, the best friend of the female lead finally went to see the male lead's place and observe his lifestyle. Despite several days having passed, the room was still dirty and messy. Lee Ja-in didn't bother to clean or tidy up, instead he just lay straight on the blanket. So the female lead's best friend, who was also the owner of the cafe, helped him clean up. She carried away heavy boxes of books to create a proper room for him. Next, she taught him how to welcome and serve customers. Although he followed her instructions and spoke exactly as she taught him, it seemed that something was still missing. Perhaps it was a smile. Just as the female lead's best friend had that thought, two female guests walked in. Lee Ja-in greeted them with an enchanting smile, leaving the two women in awe of his handsomeness. The customers started flocking in just to catch a glimpse of the handsome staff member at the cafe. The cafe owner was ecstatic because she had never earned as much money before. From initially despising Ja-in, she now referred to him as our Ja-in when the three of them talked together. The female lead wanted to invite her best friend for a heart-to-heart -heart talk, but her friend had a prior date arrangement and couldn't accompany her. Seizing the opportunity, Ja-in told the female lead that he was different. Since he had no plans for the day, she could join him. The two of them went to a somake bar to drink together. It seemed to be Ja-in's first time drinking alcohol, so he couldn't understand why people liked this bitter beverage. The female lead explained that people enjoy beer and liquor because they like getting intoxicated, as it makes their bodies lighter and allows their true selves to show. They kept drinking until they got tipsy. The female lead wanted to bid farewell as their paths diverged. However, Ja-in offered to walk her home for safety. On their way back, they noticed a firefly garden. The female lead loved fireflies because they illuminated the night, creating a beautiful sight. Observing her, the male lead stared intently at the fireflies. After a while, he also emitted a glow similar to fireflies. He laughed foolishly because he was quite drunk and asked her if she would like him if he could shine like a firefly. The female lead was speechless, unable to believe her eyes. She let out a scream. Lee Su, our female lead, screamed in fear and ran away from Ja-in, who was now glowing like a firefly. Ja-in chased after her, making her even more terrified. She was so scared that she didn't notice the deep pit in front of her. Just as Ja-in shouted for her to be careful, she fell into the abyss. 
In a desperate situation, Jia In thought about the book he read about cheetahs in the cafe's collection of books on the mystery of animals. Immediately, he tapped into the abilities of a cheetah and dashed towards the pit in an astonishing speed, safely leaping down to catch Li Su. Li Su landed safely but was still shaken. The next day at work, Li Su's colleagues were analyzing the experiments on steer, the newly discovered species of hydra. Even if parts of it are cut off, the severed portions can regenerate back into a complete form. They had created 14 new steers from the original. When they poured H2SO4, sulfuric acid, onto one of the steers, it didn't die but showed a strong reaction. More interestingly, all 14 steers exhibited similar reactions without direct contact with the H2SO4. Therefore, up to this point, they had not reached a conclusion on whether they were separate beings. Later, Li Su went outside to talk to a colleague and asked about the phenomenon of someone glowing like a firefly and having the ability to run as fast as a cheetah. The colleague thought she was still drunk, but if something like that truly existed, it wouldn't be human. It would be a research subject. In the evening, Li Su went to Jia In's cafe to clarify what happened the day before. Jia In explained to her that even though he had forgotten all his past memories, he discovered that he could become anything. However, if she hated it, he would stop. Li Su asked if there was anything else he could do, and he immediately mentioned the words, human extinction. Both of them noticed Jia En's strange behaviors, so Li Su came up with the idea of figuring it out together. She brought him an agreement, an experiment subject agreement, to conduct research on Jia En with his consent. All he had to do was sign it, and she assured him of his safety when he signed the agreement. Without further hesitation, Jia In signed it because he would do anything she liked. Until today, the cafe owner returned, and Li Su noticed Jia In's exhausted low energy appearance. She was worried about him and inquired about it. It turned out that last night, to complete the experiment, Li Su had put Jia In through a lot, taking his blood and conducting various health tests. At this moment, Li Su had just finished taking a shower and her mind wandered back to the mention of human extinction. This had something to do with his past, prior to the memory loss. The next day, when she received the test results from her colleague, contrary to her belief that Jia In had a special background, her colleague informed her that he was just a normal male human. All the test results pointed to the same conclusion. There was nothing special about him. He was just a person. But human logic couldn't explain all those things. In the lab where the bodies of the steer were stored, people noticed their intense and abnormal reactions. The reactions were so strong that the steer broke a glass container and escaped, their appearance terrifying to behold. Upon seeing this, the chief instructed another lab employee to quickly fetch another tank to contain the steer. However, before the tank could arrive, the steer extended its tentacle and lightly bit off the chief's finger. After biting, it seemed to have died. The main body died, but the other part seemed fine. From the bite mark on his finger, a red stream resembling blood spread throughout the chief's body. The lab employee, who had finally arrived with the tank, witnessed the entire scene and let out a loud scream. Outside, Li Su was bewildered, looking at Ji An's blood tube when she heard the scream and rushed in. The lab employee explained everything, and the chief by this time had gone into shock, foaming at the mouth. Li Su grabbed her phone to call an ambulance, but before she could utter a word, the chief, who was lying on the ground, suddenly woke up with eyes completely white and lunged at her aggressively. Just as his hand was about to reach her face, Ji An appeared out of nowhere, using one hand to restrain him and kicking him to the ground, rendering him unconscious once again. This scene left Li Su both terrified and astonished. How did he know she was here? But Ji An was solely focused on asking if she was okay, with a sincere, worried expression on his face. The lab employee, upon witnessing this, assumed that Ji An was Li Su's new boyfriend. At that moment, the lab employee noticed that there was a bleeding scratch on his own hand. It seemed that earlier, when the chief had abruptly risen and rushed towards Li Su, he had accidentally scratched him. Finally, the ambulance arrived and took the chief away, and the lab employee didn't think much of it, just applying a personal bandage to the scratch. Jia In told Li Su that this place is not safe. After telling Li Su that her workplace had become extremely dangerous even though he couldn't explain why, he always had that feeling. Li Su didn't ask any further questions. Initially, she was angry about being pulled away from her work, but later, she was touched by Ji An's pleading. 
She made a phone call to request a leave of absence from her superiors due to poor health and went home with Ji An. While they were in the car, they discussed the results of his body examination. According to the results, his body wasn't different from a normal human's. However, his cognitive ability was completely extraordinary. It was based on these results that she decided to trust his instincts and go with him. Even though he couldn't explain why, his sensory results were inhumanly high. She also realized that he liked her and hated others, rather than just being indifferent towards them. At the hospital, while the doctor was performing procedures to examine the chief, he was bitten by the chief on the hand. Afterwards, the chief regained consciousness and repeatedly apologized to the doctor. His consciousness was slipping in and out. He remembered the doctor saying that everything was normal, there was nothing wrong, and he seemed healthy. The doctor speculated that he went into shock because something was stressing him out. But he knew the real reason was the steer, so he needed to go back to the lab. Meanwhile, at the lab, the lab employee who had been scratched by the chief while sleeping had a mosquito bite on his neck. The blood from his body was now inside the mosquito. Back to Lee Su and Jia In. They were discussing Jia In's strange behavior since he'd lost his memory. Lee Su was sure something happened to him in the past, before he lost his memories. Because of his mention of human extinction a while ago and his abnormally low levels of sympathy, but what she truly cared about at the moment was him, why he liked her. Lee Jia-in hates everyone but likes her. Hatred is the source of all this. She really wants to know why he likes her. He shows her his power, controlling the fish under the water. He took her across the water, the waves soaring to the horizon. She gets surprised and scared and asks him to stop. But Jia-in encourages her to embrace the feeling of love and acceptance of others. That opened her up to a whole new horizon, with the most beautiful sunsets in front of her eyes. He and she continued to surf the waves with the birds towards the beautiful veil of sunset. Meanwhile, being alone at the hospital, Steer's main body is alive inside Name's body and is using its nervous system. Many people have a connection to him, who are becoming hosts for Steer to take control over and are sending a message to the main body to grow. She believes that human extinction is possible and that her role is to prevent them from doing it. She has decided to work at the IEU to protect the world, and if she protects Jia-in, she'll be saving the world. Jia-in promises to grow, protect her, and then kill them all. At IEU, doctors are talking about Name, who has passed out in the laboratory, making him difficult to approach. Human connection is essential for survival in a globalized world, but why him? On TV news, the U.S. president passed the Green New Deal, but Republican Representative Gerald, a socialist pushing for it, was found dead this morning in his estate. Richard O., the CEO of Global Oil Conglomerate, was also found dead from suicide after opposing it. The Republicans who showed opposition to the deal have now announced that they support it. Jia-in appeared. Name knows exactly who this is. His glasses fell on the floor. He looks like a zombie. Li Jia-in and were both born with the same purpose. Li Jia-in is protecting Ah Li Su from danger while Name is trying to stop him. Li Jia-in was staying quiet back then because he wasn't strong enough. Now, things are different. The door suddenly opens and doctors are running towards Jia-in. Jia-in knocks him down with his right hand and throws him out the window. Humankind is Name's weapon. But nature is Jia-in's weapon. He summoned all the doctors in the hospital to rush to Jia-in. Jia-in decided to rush down and grab his collar, throwing him hard from nearly the ground, far to the horizon. He flew as far as the forest. His back hit the rock and blood spurted from his throat. He's not dead yet. Jia-in was trying to kill him. Why isn't he dead? Jia-in used all his strength to punch him in the face. One after another, non-stop punches hit him in the face. A frontal blow was hit straight to the nose. Blood gushed from the nose, and teeth popped out of the gums. His face is deformed and swollen. He struggled to sit up. But in a moment, his face returned to normal. Jia-in wonders why it's so difficult to kill someone. Jia-in strangles him, forcing him to tell him how he can kill this man. He protested by grabbing Jia-in's right wrist and feeling every cell in Jia-in's body. Jia-in's body is a container for nature. He thought he had the power to control and rule over it. 
He summons all the animals in the forest to join forces to kill Ja In by moving his hands. Before the animals could do that, Ja In stomped on the ground and threw him in the air, flying over and knocking him down with a slam dunk to the ground, losing a chunk of flesh on his left flank. The animals panicked when he fell from the air, covered in blood. Ja In wonders if he could die after the knockout. He lay sprawled on the ground, conscious of giving up. He didn't know what he should do with this monster. But then he suddenly remembered Ja In's weakness. It's Ali Su. Seeing him in pain on the ground, a satisfied smile appeared on his lips. The host was interesting, but the user should have thought of this before using it. The crow let out a cry, and suddenly a flock of crows rushed forward. Ja In said don't try any tricks, but no, the crows did not attack Ja In, but rushed to tear him into pieces, causing him to fall completely. He was covered in blood from the crows' incisions. He has changed hosts, making it difficult to communicate with him. The speaker is asking for a favor on their computer, his folder. Ja In said he was busy, so he quickly ran away. He barely managed to mutter a few words like, my computer folder, and then slowly closed his eyes. Ali Su wonders why there aren't any customers at the cafe shop due to Ja In not coming in to work as often. Dawn suspects it's due to a relationship between her and Ja In. She suspects something is going on between them. Lee Su is implying that it's due to them. Suddenly, Dawn's hand moved into Lee Su's mouth on its own. Dawn hugged her head tightly and said, get away from her. Lee Su is confused by Dawn's explanation of what's going on. Dawn shouted, hurry, loudly. Lee Su is afraid to back down from the people outside the cafe, as they are like zombies smashing the windows. Lee Su did not know that there was a dangerous look on her. Dawn rushed to grab her. She immediately stepped back. Ja In appeared, slammed Dawn's head on the table, and said, Boss, forgive me. Ja In grabbed Dawn's head and threw it at the zombies. Ja In recalls the time Dawn suggested he try out an MBTI test to see if he got a result as an ISTP score. TV news reports that a large number of people around the world have shown odd symptoms related to the nervous system. The government believes an infectious disease is a potential cause. Patients with weaker symptoms claim to be able to sense an image or message in the form of a signal. The message appears to be from a young Korean woman with long hair with the message, rip her apart and bite her. The government hopes everyone stays safe during these odd times. On the TV news. The world's health organizations have named the disease the wave due to its initial symptoms of muscle contractions in the hand, which eventually spread through the body. The man is talking to his friend, a kid who has a wave and wants their hand. He said it feels like someone is controlling them, but it's not fake, and he finds it cool. The other man panicked and screamed his name, Min Wu, when he saw the man opening a window and jumping off. He looked down at the street through the window. Everyone was running in one direction. At the cafe shop, Ja In is trying to protect Li Su from the zombie attack. Ah Li Su is being targeted by a group of people who are not subtle. Li Su grabbed Ja In's hand and ignored the zombies. He carried Li Su to escape the zombie army. Ja In jumped to the rooftop of the cafe with Li Su on his shoulder to the surprise of the crowd. Ja In killed the manager due to a steer inside the building, but he doesn't feel any remorse for it. He had no other choice. Li Su said with a disappointed face that she needed to go back to IEU. The steer is the cause of everything, so there must be a clue in the IEU. Ja In took Li Su's hand and told her to climb on his back. Li Su swatted her hand away. Li Su decided to go by herself, but Ja In wants to protect her. Li Su had just walked to the door when a zombie rushed towards her. Ja In immediately defends her by punching the person in the face, causing him to fall face down on the floor. Ja In said Li Su is the most important thing to him, and if someone causes her harm, he will not care if they die. He uses his electric eel power to destroy all the zombies in Li Su's extreme panic. He says he would protect Li Su by all means. In the distance, a person uses his phone to live stream the entire scene just now. There are 210,038 people. 
currently watching this live stream, and they can't believe their eyes. In the conference room, they believe that a muscle disorder wave is spreading, but nobody is showing any signs of contraction. They have been gathering patients with symptoms since this morning and are waiting for results to be produced. The Prime Minister is unsure what to tell the public. One guy is running in and says the Prime Minister should take a look at the iPad and explain the urgency of the situation, as it is urgent. Meanwhile, Ja In is still fighting with the zombies to protect Lee Su. Knocking them unconscious does not stop them, as if someone is controlling them. There was a crow staring at Ja In from afar. Ja In then slammed his hand on the ground, throw a piece of stone at the crow. The zombies immediately revolted as Li Su panicked and fell to the floor. Ja In carried Li Su and jumped straight from the rooftop. The man who was doing the live stream gasped. The Prime Minister is also watching that live stream. They have confirmed that this is a real scene after reviewing nearby camera footage. The footage is gaining traction with the entire nation watching it. People in the street, in the subway, in the internet cafe, in school, students are watching. National leaders are also watching. Ja In is expressing hope that the situation will improve. A crow suddenly fell down in front of Ja In and Lee Su. Realizing that there was a scratch on Lee Su's arm, Ja In couldn't stop panicking. At the National Intelligence Service. The wave originated from the IEU, which was researching a rare breed of hydra named Steer. The files found on the computers of the research team are related to the steer species. The files found on the computers of the research team are located in a folder named A. Meanwhile, in the street where Ja In and Lee Su are standing, the most important details are that the cut on Lee Su's arm has been infected with poison and that there's no point in restricting blood flow. There is only one way to solve the problem, and that is to cut off her arm. A man opened folder A and found a diary. The most important details in this diary are the events that occurred on October 12th and October 14th. On October 21st, the main body of the steer bit the protagonist's finger and died. On October 26th, the protagonist found steer cells within their blood that were connected to the other steers. On October 31st, the protagonist joined the IEU to make the world a better place. On October 31st, the protagonist realized why this happened to them and decided to join the IEU to create a better world. Ja In and Lee Su are in the car on their way back to the IEU center. The cells have already spread throughout her body, so there is no point in cutting off the arm, as there are clues in the IEU. The steer must be eliminated if someone is viewing this folder, as it could lead to the human race going extinct. To do this, the only way is to find the host and kill it, which is fairly easy. Ali Su is from IEU Research Team 2, has an important reason for entering the facility which is not welcomed by soldiers. The main body of steer is located within a researcher and the man in the video is currently at the IEU. Li Su and Ja In need to cooperate to get something from the lab. Li Su was told to accompany the soldier when he seized her hand. What are you doing? This isn't the right moment to be doing this, yells Ja In. Take him, everyone exclaimed. Once again, he asks for Ja In's cooperation. Ja In recalled the individuals who had aimed weapons at his face and yelled, Get that out of his face as the entire army pointed firearms at him. Ja In was about to show his strength, but suddenly Li Su's hand grabbed him. She wants to cooperate with them. They were escorted into the cell to investigate by the soldiers. The steer has infected Li Su, and she is being investigated for why she needs to be cuffed. Ja In sat alone in his cell, his hands cuffed. Kim Sung Yong, the Minister of Defense, is asking Li Ja In to explain himself after a video recording of him went viral. He doesn't know where they took Ali Su. Sun Yung's father was a former member of the National Security Administration and passed away when she was little. She read his investigation notes and found a story about an unnatural existence. He died trying to investigate it. Ali Su is positive, and we have found out how to take care of the steer. We need to identify the main host of the steer and kill them. Ja In stood up and broke his hand. 
The goal is to save the world. Ja-in smashes the window in front of the woman. The glass is bulletproof, but Ja-in can still break it. The woman slowly pulled it out of the picture in her pocket. Sun Yung is trying to convince themselves that Ja-in's age is untrue, but Ja-in believes it is. Tears stream down Ja-in's cheeks. A peaceful evening in the blue house. The Republic of Korea government is approving the killing of a researcher as it is necessary to eliminate the steer as soon as possible. It wrote on negating the spread of rare diseases and declaring a state of emergency. The plan will be directed by the current Minister of National Defense, Commander Kim sung yong The plan will involve details regarding the capture and killing of the host, Ah Lee Su. However, the president is hesitant to compare the lives of everyone against one another, as it is a sacrifice to make for the greater good. The research team is still not sure what Steer is fully capable of, as they need to eliminate it as soon as possible. Without action, they are unable to do anything. He doesn't have a choice. He signs the paper. The team leader received approval as he expected. He looks at Lee Su in the cell right now and feels sorry for her. It's unfortunate that she needs to die. Sun Yung wonders why Ja In is crying after seeing a picture of him and his mother. Ja In remembers when his mother hugged him. Remember, when mother and son hold hands in the flower field. Even when Ja In's mother is dying and caressing his face. That's why he cried. Then suddenly, he stopped crying. Sun Yung feels that something changes with Ja In. Seems like Son Yung brought him here to get revenge. Son Yung said too much time has passed for that. She was young at that time and doesn't even remember what her father looked like. She remembers that he was brought in to get revenge for her father's death. She wants to get information for the security of the nation, but all Ja In wants is the photo, and if Son Yung is given the photo, he will not kill her. Son Yung said, and if she refused, that irritated Ja In. Ja In punched the wall with all his strength, breaking the glass into a hundred pieces. Ja In does not want her to refuse. This scares Son Yung to death. Ja In has experienced thousands of deaths and has lost his entire world. He believes that the death of a single human means nothing now, as it is only the death of a single human. He's going to Li Su's place. Ja In stepped out of the hole in the wall to the surprise of the soldiers. The captain orders a change in the watch con level from DEFCON 2 to DEFCON 1, full alert. They're asking the president to approve the procedure of euthanasia to stop the steer. They have already gotten the approval of the president, but Lee Su still needs time to gather her thoughts and consider the lives of everyone else on the planet and theirs. Lee Su doesn't accept the truth, asking how they will proceed and whether they will make sure she passes away without any pain. Dawn found Ja In on the street. Dawn is looking for Lee Su, but she is not picking up her phone. Troops, tanks, and helicopters are aiming at Ja In and Dawn, who are confused. They need to identify the host of the steer and kill them. They stop firing and wait for the captain's command. Ja In feels disgusted. Ja In asks Dawn whether she wants to go see Lee Su. They need to identify the steer host and kill them. But Ja In wonders why, as Lee Su and Mom are different. Ja In asks Dawn if she wants to go see Ah Lee Su, but Dawn does not answer. The whole army is shocked and terrified by Ja In, who is trying to help him and Ah Lee Su in order to save more humans. Dawn doesn't understand what Ja In is talking about. She's really scared. The captain orders them to prepare their weapons. Before the captain could finish his sentence, Ja In grabbed his mouth and lifted it into the air. To Ja In, sacrifice is something people decide on their own, not something they force upon others. It is a choice between the survival of the fittest and stepping over the rights of the weak, and Ja In has already made his decision. Ja In squeezed the captain's eyes, causing him to die instantly on the spot. Ja In's hand was covered in blood. Ja In recalls his childhood. He's already crushed many human lives. He's used to this feeling and is now comfortable with it. He wants to eliminate all humans in the world, but why did he save Lee Su? Ja In feels disgusted and needs to get rid of them. This is dangerous and he needs to get rid of them. 
Jain swung his right hand, and the whole army is covered in blood. Dawn witnessed the whole scene and cried, silently. The reporter recorded from the helicopter. The scene was very catastrophic. The mysterious man completely destroyed the soldiers sent by the government. The scene was like a cruel battlefield. Although the government sent a special army, they were still destroyed by this mysterious man. The mysterious man is like a monster. People cannot imagine his strength. The notice system Jain has learned the language of mankind. Then he learned human thoughts, and finally, the world of mankind. Ja'in wondered if humanity was the measure of everything after he had experienced all the forms of existence, witnessing a lot of human actions. So Ja'in thinks he's not biased when it comes to destroying humanity. And in the end, Ja'in still doesn't like human arrogance. While Ja'in was thinking below opposite the building, Lee Dawn was in danger by a knife flying from the air. Ja'in blocked that knife to save Lee Dawn after he had learned humanity's kindness from the teammates he met. A soldier attacked Ja'in with multiple shots when he saw Ja'in saving Lee Dawn. Ja'in was very annoyed by the soldier's actions. Now, Ja'in's feelings are very chaotic. He feels that humans are complex and confusing. However, Ja'in still responds to the soldier with a cold expression. Ja'in was preparing to destroy the soldier when Lee Dawn quickly stopped him because she saw Ja'in now looked very scary. Eventually, Ja'in couldn't give up the thought, and he gave up wanting to destroy the soldier. And for a moment, Ja'in remembered the manager who had said that Ja'in needed to find the host of the steer and destroy it, all to save humanity. Ja'in used to think so in front of the desolate scenery of the city. Ja'in thought about the person he loved and he promised to protect that girl at all costs. At the IEU Research Center, a steer, Parasite, is inside Lee Su's body, controlling another steer to attack Lee Su's life-threatening person. The staff in the building are alarmed to announce that Arisu has been annexed by steer and they must move on to Plan B. The target is now Arisu. They must destroy all those who have had the parasite by Steer in them as soon as they find out. Lee Su injured herself to stop Steer from manipulating her. Suddenly, Lee Su hears a voice, Steek's voice, which reminds Lee Su to take a closer look at the situation because the people from the research center just want to destroy Lee Su. Lee Su made Steer silent, but the Steer continued to speak, and it's reminding Lee Su now both Lee Su and it were in the same body, right? Lee Su heard the steer say this and was furious. She continued to injure herself, after which Lee Su discovered a gun. Lee Su plans to destroy herself with the gun after she remembers what the man said. He wants Lee Su to destroy himself because it is the last way to save the world, sacrificing Lee Su's life in exchange for the life of the world. He wants Lee Su to sympathize with him because this is a forced situation. Lee Su breaks down, then she picks up a gun and gets ready to destroy her life, but is stopped by the steer. The steer doesn't want Lee Su to harm herself. Just when Lee Su was about to hit herself, Cha In promptly came and rescued her. The man reminded Lee Su to destroy himself quickly because there were a lot of steers outside. He added that Lee Su's existence alone threatens the whole world to become bad. Cha In is angry after hearing the man say this. He reminds Lee Su not to be too arrogant and not to let others control her thoughts. After that, Ja In comforts Lee Su and promises to protect Lee Su until the last moment, after which Ja In destroys the man as if to confirm his promise is true. Lee Su looks at Ja In. She felt very emotional that Ja In had saved her with that amazing power. Ja In easily destroys the soldiers. Ja In destroys them very gently, like he is playing with the soldiers rather than fighting with them. Lee Su looked at Ja in destroying them in horror. She cried and begged Ja In not to destroy the soldiers anymore. Ja In stopped and spared the last soldier after he had wiped out the soldiers present in that room. The scene was like a fierce battlefield. Lee Su is still terrified by Ja In's brutal scene. She can't believe Ja In in front of her is the lovely person she knows. Ja In assumes that the people he destroys are the ones who want to destroy Lee Su, and Ja In only destroys them before they can destroy Lee Su. Su, which in human language is called legitimate defense. Lee Su suddenly asks Jane who he is, but Ja In only answers, he is Lee Ja In. Lee Su doesn't believe it. She denies Ja In's answer. Ja In explained that if Lee Su judged others by how they acted, then the person that she knew was just an empty shell. And now, he 
is the real Jia In. He also said that if there is anything in common, it is that even if the world perishes, Jia In will still protect Li Su at all costs. Eventually, Jia In advises Li Su to leave now because the soldiers are about to attack them. But as soon as Jia In takes Li Su's hand to take her away, Li Su knocks Jia In's hand away. Li Su throws Jia In's hand away because Li Su wants to be sacrificed here. But Jia In stops her and says that Li Su cannot be destroyed here because he will protect her. Li Su is still resolute with her decision because Li Su knows that Steer is very dangerous and she doesn't want to make others infected. Jia In intended to use his power to split his arms and legs to take away, but Jia In was afraid of Li Su, so he gave up that idea. Later, Jia In asked Li Su, wanted to sacrifice her life because Jia In knew that people always desire to live and Jia In believed that Li Su was the same. Jia In asked Li Su to survive at all costs, and Li Su cried after hearing Jia In say so. They hugged each other among the bodies lying everywhere that Jia In destroyed. Jia In protected Li Su from the outside dangers that hurt her. Li Su reminisces about everything until yesterday. Her life was normal, but to this day, it is dyed fishy red. And Arisu now just exists as a threat to the whole world, and everyone wants to destroy it. Li Su and Jia In were looking for something, but it seemed that someone had taken it away, and suddenly, Li Su sensed that a lot of people were going there. The commander is briefly talking about the situation of the battle. From now on, the soldiers face a real battle. This is a real deal. As everyone saw on the video, the strength of the enemy is terrible. Currently, more than 2,000 people have been destroyed. While the commander was talking, on the top floor of the building, both Steer and the monster appeared there. Jia In reminded Li Su to cover her eyes. The commander was giving orders to aim when Jia In gently landed and wiped out the soldiers. At the government building, the president didn't agree with the opinion given by the commander, but the commander insisted on keeping it. The president had no choice but not to accept the option of dropping bombs on the city where both Jia In and Li Su were present because there were many people living there. The commander then used a gun to intimidate the president, who eventually chose to kill the president and then reported the results he had faked at the scene to staff to fake the president's death. The soldiers entered while hearing the noise. They were shocked to find the president dead. The commander argued that the president had been seized by the steer and that he had to kill the president urgently to save everyone's lives. The government soldiers didn't believe what the commander said, so he had his subordinates destroy all the government soldiers. He also called on his subordinates to make the president's chief secretary come, after which he kicked everyone out to talk to the chief secretary in private. The chief clerk looked at what the commander had done. It was like a terrible battlefield, and he did not dare to believe this fact. But the commander reminded the secretary that the president had been infected with steer if not destroyed immediately, he would have died together. The commander said that was the only option he was forced to make to save the Blue House. He then demanded the use of the army to run the country. Not only that, but he also wanted to fire mass missiles at the city where Steer and Jia In were present, but the chief secretary fiercely objected. The commander didn't like the way the chief secretary worked, which was to listen to the people and then decide by vote. But this method only worked in peaceful times, and now it is so old. The commander finished the chief secretary for dissent, then summoned politicians through the Greenhouse Communications Network to test Steer for infection. And Li, Jia In, and Arisu were all also missing. The commander ordered at all costs to find them, whether they had to use satellites and military or any other measures to find the position of those two people. The commander contentedly sat down in the presidency he had just taken. He had a tumor in his brain because he had not treated it in time, so he didn't have much time to live. So before he dies, he wants to destroy Jia In to make history for him, so that he dies and enjoys the reputation of a hero. At this time, Arisu and Jia In were comfortably watching the sea and didn't care about the world anymore. They were enjoying the sunset over the sea in front of them. A soldier is driving, and he informs the commander they are going to Parliament in five minutes. The commander is interested in Arisu and Jia In's location. The soldier reports that they have used all means but still cannot find them, and they will continue to search. Suddenly, it's pouring rain. In a cave, Arisu and Jia In were sheltering from the rain here. Arisu suddenly asked if Jia In was hungry. Jia In told Arisu to wait, and he would go find food. 
Suddenly, Arisu pointed the gun at Ja-In and said Ja-In couldn't destroy her. Ja-In didn't refuse, then Arisu continued to point the gun at herself. Ja-In was fed up with this action. It had probably happened so many times already. Arisu said she remembered everything. Ja-In destroyed a lot of people, without hesitation. And in the end, Arisu wanted to live so Ja-In saved Arisu and destroyed the government army. Arisu wanted to know who Ja-In was, and what he did before he lost his memory and why Jain hated people so much. Jain explained that because he knew so well, he hated humans like that. Jain used to blindly like humans, but there are many species born like that, like mental illness. Jain said as he walked up to Arisu, Arisu shouted in panic, asking Jain to stop, but Jain didn't care. Jain finally grabbed the gun in Arisu's hand. Arisu didn't understand what Jain was saying, so Jain offered to tell it from the beginning, and Arisu would make her judgment. After Jain finished speaking, Arisu was silent and said nothing. She understood why Jain was acting the way he did. Steer has awakened, and Ja-In also recognizes it. He says that as soon as it takes over Arisu's entire body, he will destroy it. And now, Ja-In won't care about it. It offers to cooperate with Ja-In to destroy humanity and promises that after completing that mission, it will leave Arisu's body. Ja-In hates people because he understands them well. By Arisu's standards, it is not right to hurt and destroy others. It is very clear and obvious. Arisu can tell this to anyone. Ja-In's actions are wrong before hearing his stance. Ja-In has been beaten to death despite loving his master, living with the man who took his eyes and was raised like a pig, unable to fly and then eaten by that person, who has suffered many wounds and countless existences. All human sins are there. Ja-In then asked Arisu if he reversed that position, what would it be like if people suffered the pain they caused? Arisu said that among the people Ja-In destroyed there would also be people like like Arisu, or the person that used to be Ja-In's mother. They were also the whole world to someone. So Arisu couldn't ignore this. Arisu can't help but be interested in this issue. Then, she asks Ja-In if he wants her to continue living. Arisu suddenly mentions the deserted island she used to visit. Arisu asks Ja-In to go to an island where no one has ever been to live, so Ja-In won't have to destroy humans anymore. Arisu's words were the same as the marriage proposal Ja-In had read in the book. Arisu didn't object to what Ja-in said, so Ja-in suddenly felt embarrassed. At night, while Arisu was sleeping, Ja-in suddenly remembered Arisu's offer. She wanted to live with him in a place where there was no one. Ja-in involuntarily smiled when he thought about it. Ja-in was feeling happy about Arisu's suggestion when Steer woke up. It was annoyed to see Ja-in so happy. It reminded Ja-in not to forget his promise to destroy humanity with it. Later, Ja-in annoyed it even more by kissing Arisu. Suddenly, it realized, from the beginning, it wanted to invade Ja-in's body because Ja-in was the last strong of humanity. And this was its chance to take over Ja-in's body. Steer wanted to take over the body of the most powerful creature alive in this world, so it took over Ja-in's body. However, Ja-in easily prevented its entry into his body by Ja-in purifying Steer's invading cells. Ja-in confidently asserts that he can destroy Steer whenever he wants, which makes Steer skeptical as Ja-in has let it go. Steer is even more confused. Ja-in has lived a long time, but he still wants life. Moreover, for Ja-in, Arisu is not enough for him to risk his life. Steer continues to reiterate his offer to cooperate in destroying humanity with Ja-in. He asks Ja-in when he will help him fulfill this promise, but Ja-in just looks at him coldly and doesn't care. Ja-in tells Steer not to bother him. Ja-in wants Arisu to be safe no matter what the circumstances, telling Steer to wait until then. At the capital, the commander nominated himself for the presidency and he destroyed all those who refused to put him in the position. The commander publicized the number of people injured and destroyed in the battles for the people. Civilians, 32,000 injured and 1,259 dead. And the cause of everything is being that it is uncontrolled by modern science. He also mentioned that the reason was that there are two beings behind everything. Li Su, the host of the steer, and Li Jia-in, a monster with unknown powers. And as the acting president, regardless of what it might take, he will promise this. The world will know the danger posed by these two beings. Kim Sung-yong promised to his people. 
Ja-in recalled what Arisu told him, not because Ja-in aspires to life, but because Ja-in is aspiring for a taller, warm ending of Ja-in who aspires to the warmth of love. On a desert island, Ja-in brought Arisu here as promised. They were in North Korea. Son Yung impatiently seeks information from Arisu and Ja-in. It has been seven months, and he has not had any news from the two of them. The secretary reported that in addition to that, they now face problems from the United Nations. They demand that South Korean authorities be held accountable for the wave of steer contagion. Son Yung is rushing to find Arisu and Ja-in. Outside the greenhouse, people are demonstrating to demand the overthrow of the military dictatorship. On the desert island, Ja-in and Arisu are arguing as they struggle for survival on the desert island. Arisu suspects Ja-in only knows how to steal and destroy others. Arisu admires Da-woon when she can work with Ja-in. In the end, Arisu asks Ja-in to stand still and not do anything because they can't work as a team, and Arisu can't trust Ja-in anymore. Ja-in gets frustrated when he hears Arisu scolds him, because Arisu was the one who invited Ja-in to the desert island to stay with her in the first place. Ja-in was thinking when he continued to be scolded by Arisu because he stood still and didn't work. Ja-in was helpless. They finally finished packing the necessities on the desert island, Arisu was resting when she suddenly wanted a beer, and Ja-in offered to go get it for Arisu. Arisu agrees, and she reminds Ja-in not to harm others. The two of them were drinking beer and discussing life on the island in the future. Arisu was anxious to prepare for winter when Ja-in suggested that they didn't need to prepare, just move to the summer island when winter came. While Ja-in is sleeping, Arisu has bad intentions to harm Ja-in, but Lee Su stops it in time and warns it. Lee Su notices that the parasites were slowly adapting to her cells. Lee Su didn't feel too impatient. She warned them that Ja-in would handle them. At the research center, people are desperately searching for Ja-in and Arisu's information. But as usual, they still can't find any results today, so they were bracing themselves to hear their boss curse. Lee Su has linked the steer network across the earth and controls the satellite so that Sun Yung's people cannot find Ja-in and her whereabouts. With this capacity, Lee Su can ensure that Ja-in will not destroy anyone and that no one can injure Ja-in. At the Yoduk concentration camp, the 15th management room, a soldier was destroyed, but he did not scream at all. Gu Wukja was 17 years old. Wukja had been trained from a young age to become an assassin. Today, he has escaped because his mother passed away. The boy came to his mother's grave, but there was no tombstone. A man informed Wuk Ja that the villagers were waiting to spread his mother on the Ipsok River. The boy asked about his mother's situation before she passed away, and the man said that she passed away very gently. The boy then asks about the man's situation. The man also asks about Da Woon's next plan. He says that on the way here, he killed three prison guards. If Da Woon is caught, he will be shot by them. The boy asks the man the place to go. He needs to find a place where no one can find him. The man who guided the boy down south. The boy not only fled the country, but was also the one who fled the country and was guilty of destroying others. Da Woon has just escaped to a desert island when he meets Ja In and Lee Su, eating. The prison manager is studying the information about Da Woon. The boy joined the army three years ago, and the boy lied to enlist and the major of the 649th squadron was tricked by the boy because Da Woon is an extremely monstrous person. Lee Su is curious how Da Woon was able to get to the island. The boy is about to attack Lee Su when Ja In promptly defends Lee Su. Lee Su is surprised by the boy's actions and she angrily scolds Da Woon. Da Woon had planned to let the two of them leave, but the boy had no choice. Lee Su reminded Ja In not to destroy the boy, standing in front of Ja In, Da Woon has no power to resist. Da Woon advances to attack Ja In, but Ja In easily blocks the boy with one hand. Da Woon is surprised that he's already slashed Ja In, but the wound is gone. Da Woon doubts his ability after attacking Ja In. Lee Su says that they made a misunderstanding, but Da Woon still doesn't care and thinks that Ja In and Lee Su are North Korean spies. Da Woon overcame Ja In's protective class. He used Lee Su to threaten Ja In and asked Ja In to stand still. 
Li Su realized that Jia In was about to destroy Da Wun, so she was faster. Li Su infected the steer parasite to Wun's skin and controlled him. Because Da Wun was impolite to Li Su, he was taught basic politeness by Li Su. Li Su got into an argument with Jia In because he wanted to destroy Da Wun even though Da Wun was just a child. Jia In counters to Li Su that Da Wun is already an adult and that he intends to destroy Li Su, but Li Su says that Da Wun is still young. Da Wun is angry at their conversation and Li Su is having a headache because they have to live with three people now, but Jia In doesn't like it. Jia In just wants the two of them to be enough. Li Su is not sure how to do it when Da Wun suddenly shouts he wants them to destroy him because Da Wun doesn't want to beg the South Koreans. Li Su has to steer to control the boy because Da Wun is too noisy. Li Su shows Da Wun her abilities. Li Su only needs one finger to easily destroy Da Wun. So if Da Wun wants to be destroyed, Li Su will help him. Li Su said that she would count to three if Da Wun didn't say anything, then Li Su would help Da Wun say goodbye to this life. As soon as Li Su counted to one, Da Wun begged Li Su to let him live. Finally, Da Wun calmed down after talking to Li Su. He is no longer as loud or overbearing as he was at first. At the prison, the prison manager receives information that the entire Gu Uk Ja case will be delegated to the Ministry of Defense. He's curious why the Ministry of Defense found them. The soldier says it's related to a mission they were assigned before arriving at the concentration camp. While eating, Jia In and Li Su learn about the plight of Da Wun. He's been in the military since he was a child because he committed a mistake and was sent to prison. He escaped, and when he returned, his mother had passed away, and the boy had drifted to this desert island on his way out of the country. Son Yung sent the general of North Korea a video of the war that Jia In was involved in. The general was very interested in the video, but he didn't believe the person in the video was real. Sun Yung says he has no reason to deceive the general, but the current position Sun Yung is because he got from the coup, so the general does not trust Sun Yung. The general also claimed that Sun Yung was deliberately doing so to divert public opinion. Currently, there is a monster in the video that Sun Yung sent to the general, who is in North Korea, and it's the source of the infection this time. Sun Yung corrected the South Korean general, not that they sent it, but that it was defecting. The general said that if what Sun Yung said was true, they needed to repay South Korea because their country would not be in turmoil due to an infectious disease and that the monster had to be dealt with by South Korea. Sun Yung doesn't accept the general's offer. Sun Yung suggests that as long as the general allows South Korea to enter the port of the Republic. But the general refused and left. One soldier still believed that Ja In in the video was real, but the general insisted that it was just South Korean filmmaking techniques. The upcoming Baekdu mountain explosion will be blamed on the monster sent from South Korea. Since Da Woon has committed a crime, he needs to go south, and if Da Woon needs help from Lee Su, she will help him. Da Woon cannot be arrested or he'll be shot before losing Da Woon's mother wants him to survive at all costs. Suddenly, Ja In spotted a group of people approaching his position. Da Woon found out that it was partisans who came to arrest Da Woon. The boy was terrified, but Ja In comforted the boy and promised to help him fulfill his promise to his mother. After a month, a name appeared for this once uninhabited island, the Red Island. Due to the amount of attention it gathered, it was also known in English as Blood Island. Ja In informs Arisu in advance, and although he knows that she won't like it, what matters to Ja In is Da Woon and Arisu's lives. If the two of them were in danger, Ja In had to destroy the danger to protect the two of them. The general was drinking tea when a soldier came in to announce that the entire 649th had been defeated, and that the survivors returning from the battle were still terrified and trembling from what they had experienced. Fact that the monster that the general saw through the video was real, the general asked the soldier to tell everything. As soon as Team 649 neared the island, the monster got its hands on the water and a tornado appeared that swept all of Team 649 into it. The general had switched to the plan of attacking from the sky. They would turn the island into a sea of fire. But it didn't take long for Ja In to finish handling the aerial troops sent by North Korea, and the general was furious. And at this point, he accepted the video sent by South Korea to be true. The general ordered troops to attack the Red Island with nuclear weapons, but Ja In used the biggest things to blow back the nuclear weapons toward the North Korean military. No matter what technology or weaponry North Korea uses, it cannot affect the island under Ja In's protection. The general took a last plan. 
he went to the leader of the People's Republic of China. The upcoming war will be extremely unique and fascinating. Everyone will watch whether the combined army of North Korea and the People's Republic of China is capable of countering the tremendous power of Jain. Please click the like and subscribe buttons below to receive information for the next episode. Don't forget to comment your thoughts below this post.